Uh, we are about to begin. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Scott Robinson, the uh, Bellman Chair of Public Service and the Chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of Oklahoma. It is my honor this morning to introduce Professor Alan Hertzke. Uh, Professor Hertzke holds a David Boyd Chair at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, that may seem like just a mysterious series of words for a lot of people, but let me explain a little bit about what that means. About 80 years ago, the University of Oklahoma created this program to recognize those uh, professors who served as an inspiration for their excellence in teaching. And uh, Professor Hertzke has certainly done that. He has touched many, many lives in his 35 years teaching at the University of Oklahoma. But his influence has extended beyond the classroom as well. He served as an associate director for the Carl Albert Center uh, on our campus. He has founded the program in religious studies that has grown to become the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Oklahoma and currently serves as a fellow in the Institute for the American Heritage, American Constitutional Heritage, uh, specializing in the topic we'll hear more about today, uh, the role of religious freedom in our, our constitution, but also our society as a whole. His influence extends beyond the campus in Norman as well. He has uh, affiliations with religious studies programs at Georgetown University and Baylor University, and I'll give you a moment to think about the implications of being recognized by both of those institutions for the study of religion. He also represents the social sciences for the Pontifical Academy uh, in Rome. So as you see, it's someone who has, is deeply committed to both the enterprise of education and the enterprise of understanding the role of religion and the protection of religious freedoms in our country. But you're not here to listen to me speak today. You're here to hear the last lecture from Professor Alan Hertzke for his course, Religion and the American Constitution. Well, thank you, Scott. Gratitude is what I'm feeling today. It has been an absolute privilege and an honor to have served on the faculty at the University of Oklahoma for these past 35 years. <clears throat> and I just want to say that it's, it's so special to see students here, colleagues, friends, uh, and people on YouTube, I understand. Uh, uh, coming into this event, um, and it's really about you all. It's really about this university. It's about the OU family that's been so special to our family. America's first freedom, national cornerstone and global talisman. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Those are the first 16 words of our Bill of Rights. In a sense, religious freedom is the first freedom. And as I will show, it has been and can continue to be, if we preserve it, a cornerstone uh, to our constitutional heritage, to our civil society, to our democracy. But what about a global talisman? <clears throat> I'll talk some more about that. But in a sense, not only has religious freedom, the first freedom, served as a cornerstone to American society, history, and so forth. But there's been an interplay between the United States constitutional experience and global realities. And what I'm going to be sharing with you today is a vast an amazing global research enterprise that corroborates the centrality of religious freedom to all that we hold dear, to democracy, to peace, to women's empowerment, 
to uplift for the poor. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about how there is this, not only this great interplay, um, but also some challenges that go back and forth. National Cornerstone. Religious liberty has been absolutely central to the development of liberty in the United States, to our democracy, and to a thriving civil society. But this is not just a celebration, <clears throat> because religious freedom also functions as an aspiration, a challenge, and sometimes even a rebuke, because we all know how far our society has fallen short of our own ideals. We all know ways in which not only religious liberty, but other liberties have been crushed and violated throughout our history. Uh, so in a sense, the promise of those first 16 words, the promise of religious liberty, the promise that there will be no established religion, the promise that all will be treated equally and have equal dignity in their faith is a challenge and sometimes a rebuke. Now this great tradition in free exercise of religion, religious liberty, was forged in the crucible of religious persecution. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, introduce you to someone, my students in the class know of uh, Mr. Roger Williams. Um, <clears throat> but we'll have him speak for himself. As some of you know, I have multiple personality disorder um, and I like to share of the voices of other persons. So let's hear from Mr. <clears throat> Roger Williams for a minute. So I was trained at, at Cambridge in theology, got a doctorate in theology. I went to the new world with a great hope of religious freedom in the new land. Uh, and, but when I got there, I was disturbed to find that many of the patterns in the old world, the fusion of religion and state, the coercion of religion by state authorities was practiced in the colonial Massachusetts, where I first had a pastorate. I was also disturbed by the fact that they didn't buy the land from the native tribes, and I criticized them for that. But I basically said that coercion in faith is a violation, is a violation of God's will. And why is that? Because, my friends, Soul freedom is a gift from God. Soul freedom, your conscience is a gift from God, and no one has the right to violate the sacred haven of conscience. Now, as you can imagine, this offended some of the Puritan authorities, and so I was banished in the middle of winter. Uh, but I made my sojourn to a place I called Providence, because it was providential. Uh, and then I was befriended, befriended by um, several Indian tribes there, uh, Narragansett and some others, Wapanawags. And I learned their languages. I bought land. We worked together. And what I actually realized, and this was a great insight to me as a European, as a colonial settler, the dignity, the soul freedom, the right to follow conscience inherited in them as well as me. And that was, that was actually the argument I made in a book called The Bloody Tenet of Persecution for the Cause of Faith, that everyone has soul freedom. Men, women, Muslims, Jews, heathens, non-believers, native tribesmen, all have soul freedom because it's a gift from God. And no one has the right to crush that soul freedom. And you know, I met a woman, Mary Dyer, who was a Quaker. Now, I despised Quaker theology. I thought they were all wrong. But Mary Dyer was convicted of her own conscience. She believed that it was wrong for the Puritan authorities to deny her the right to share her Quaker inner light in the colony. And she went back Again and again, they would banish her, and finally, she became a martyr for the cause of conscience. Yes, the Boston authorities in 1660 hung Mary Dyer 
for refusing to follow a law she saw as unjust. But that's what it takes, my friends, to advance religious freedom, to advance liberty, is it takes heroes of conscience. Certainly Mary Dyer was one of those. Well, as you can see with Mr. Roger Williams, here was a figure and there were many others who pushed the envelope, who demanded their conscience rights, who demanded their free exercise of religion, who demanded their soul freedom to, to be preserved. But there's another way uh, in which religious liberty is a cornerstone. It certainly was a cornerstone of the, of the struggle for liberty against tyrannical government, no question. But it was also a cornerstone of the democratic revolution taking place in the United States. This is a quote from John Adams. It was a later quote, later reflecting in life. But he was really referring to a, a dramatic religious awakening that, it, that occurred called the Great Awakening in the couple of decades before the American Revolution. And what happened was, Americans began to realize that they could practice their faith independent of established churches. They could have revivals outside. The, the established state churches, which was the practice in Europe since the days of Constantine, was challenged. And people began to realize that they had a religiously democratic culture that was emerging. And if they could challenge religious authorities who were in bed with the state, who were aligned with the state, right, then they could challenge the British authorities, the crown even. And as John Adams said, the revolution was in the minds and hearts of the people, a change in their religious sentiments, so their duties and obligations. So there's no question that religious liberty was central to the awakening of a, of a stirring of people. Now my hero, my soulmate, my ur text by James Madison, his memorial and remonstrance. Um, James Madison was, in fact, the author of the First Amendment, but he was so much more than that. You know, James Madison, when he was 25 years old, um, joined the, the convention to draft in 1776, the, 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 the draft the uh, Virginia Declaration of Rights. And you know what's interesting about James Madison? Um, there was a great statement of religious freedom in that Virginia Declaration. But you know what it talked about? It talked about the fullest toleration. And James Madison said, wait a minute. Toleration, it sort of implies a condescending attitude by a powerful to a weaker. And he said, no, we have to change that language and say free exercise of religion. And of course, that was the language that was embedded in the First Amendment. And this was his genius, I think. He understood, as did Roger Williams, that conscience, in a sense, has rights because it has duties that rights of conscience and religious freedom are never surrendered. Obviously, they must be balanced, to be, as we would say in our class, state interest. And this is what he said in the Memorial and Remonstrance, the duty we owe to our Creator is precedent both in order of magnitude and degree of obligation to the claims of civil society. And Hertzke's dictum, or rejoinder, is that, in a sense, Madison's message is the measure of, of a free society is the extent to which it doesn't force people to choose between their religious convictions, their religious duties, their obligations to the creator, and the claims of civil society, their duties or privileges in society. Now, obviously, these have to be balanced. But a free society, to a certain extent, is one that accords that kind of maximum free exercise. And James Madison was horrified that Baptists in 1775 were being jailed in Virginia for performing marriages outside of the established church. Uh, like Roger Williams, he despised established churches because he saw them as corrupt and producing tyranny. 
Now, religious liberty, we know from great historical work, is a cornerstone to a vibrant civil society. The end of established religion, and by the way, my students are here in the class, you all know this, the end of religious establishments was a hard slogging state by state affair. It didn't just happen when the Constitution was, ado was adopted. After all, the First Amendment didn't apply to the states originally. Um, but it was a hard slogging affair, and it was fought by religious dissenters, Quakers and Baptists and skeptics, Unitarians, Jews, and others. But once religion was freed from the paternalistic hand of the state, once it was no longer funded and supported by the state, or if you were a minority, harassed by the state, once religion became a genuinely voluntary set of free communities, not only did religion thrive, but civil society flourished. And we saw in the wake of the disestablishment in the 1830s and 40s, which Tocqueville wrote so eloquently about, there was just this yeasty growth of churches and societies and charities and orphanages and hospitals and so forth. Something about unleashing free religion unleashed that initiative. And what I'm going to suggest is that the American experience, halting though it was, imperfect though it was, provided a kind of model and laboratory which global scholars now are showing confirms some of the insights from the American experience. When religion is independent of the state, when the state is no longer using the sword of law to either impose a particular orthodoxy or to harass dissenters and dissidents, once that happens, religion not only flourishes, it becomes better, more authentic, more what it was meant to be. Roger Williams was just stunned by the fact that Christians would persecute in the name of faith. And he said, how in the world does that make sense as followers of the Prince of Peace who did not use the sword of the state? And it was, and the United States was the first nation to disentangle the institutions of religion from the institutions of the state. And we now have vast global scholarship that demonstrates that whenever religion is enmeshed with the state, with the state, whenever the state arrogates to itself the role of enforcing religious orthodoxy, it produces tyranny, it produces violence, it produces sullen populations, it produces hypocritical and bad religion. And scholars have called this Putnam and Campbell American grace. The United States, they argued, they're strange now, but they argued is the one society that is thoroughly religious or vibrantly religious, not thoroughly, but vibrantly religious, deeply pluralistic and also civil that societies that are deeply religious often have deep religious factions and dissensions. But, but in the United States, they argue, American grace is, a, is the kind of condition in which, however imperfectly, people will defend the rights of others to exist in society and to practice their faith, as we'll see uh, in a few minutes. Something that I don't think is appreciated well enough is that religious liberty, the independence of churches, has been a cornerstone in the struggle for justice. And Frederick Douglass uh, is, a, is a great exemplar of this. So let's hear from Mr. Douglass for a moment. I thundered righteousness against slave owners against the hypocrisy of Christians who claimed to follow the Prince of Peace, but who held others in bondage. I was asked once to give an address 
on the 4th of July. And I gave an address on the 5th of July. What to the slave is your 4th of July? Is your great celebration of independence? It's a sham. It's a hypocrisy. It's a grotesque abuse of truth. But I want to talk about something that is less well known because obviously this speech has been produced. I've given it numerous times. I was exposed to two kinds of Christian faith in my life. Early as a slave, before I escaped and taught myself to read and write, early as a slave, I heard the slave version of the Christian faith. How slaves are meant to obey their masters. But then, secretly entering into an African Methodist African Methodist Episcopal Church, a black church, a church of freedmen and ex-slaves, I heard a different message. It was a message of authentic Christianity, of the dignity of all persons, of the equality of all persons, of God being on the side of the oppressed. This was dazzling to me. And actually, throughout my life, not only as a devout Christian, but as one who could criticize the corrupt faith that was enmeshed with slavery. I led secret Sunday schools. I taught authentic Christianity. And let me say a word about another colleague of mine, Sojourner Truth. Really intimidating woman. Sojourner Truth was not only an ex-slave who fought against slavery, she was a fierce woman who fought on behalf of women's equality and suffrage. And she understood as well that the message of the gospel was this radical equality. And I loved it when she was asked to speak and she basically said, the Lord has made me a sign unto the nation. And my friends, that's what I have experienced, that those of us who are independent of the powers that be have a prophetic voice. We can crit criticize the hypocrisies of those who profess their faith. You can see the insight here. When churches are no longer enmeshed with the state, when they're voluntary societies, then those churches can offer a prophetic critique of the society at large. And throughout American history, we have seen that happen. But notice, when churches are so enmeshed when the, with powers that be, in this case with the southern slave owners, and the slave societies. They became compromised. They became hypocritical. They became bad Christianity. Finally, I want to say something about religious liberty as a cornerstone to a more inclusive society. Since 1965, when the United States basically liberalized its immigration laws and, and eliminated restrictions on where an immigrant can come from. We have been a haven for immigrants throughout the world, but also exiles, refugees, a variety of newcomers. And what newcomers find is that the promise of religious liberty, the constitutional heritage, the free exercise of religion, um, enables them to claim their place at the civic table. And I've studied this. I did a study for the Pew Research Center, and we looked at all of the different religious groups in Washington, D.C. I was struck by the fact that every conceivable religion in the world feels the need to have an office, however small and ratty, in, wa in Washington, D.C., so the Buddhists, the Sikhs, the Baha'is, the Ahmadiyya, the Sufis, the Hindus, the Muslims, Jews, obviously, Christians of every denomination. 
So they find a place at the civic table. And I remember when I was working at the Pew Research Center and they would bring in delegations from around the world. And we would put together slide presentations on the American religious landscape. And often when uh, Muslim groups or Hindu groups or others come to the United States, they would be stunned to learn, oh, there are thou uh, several thousand mosques in the United States. There's every conceivable synagogue, mosque, temple, church, gurwara, gurwara in the United States. And that enables people to really find their place to, to capture that place at the civic table. But it also, when it works, and often it has been violated, when it works, it also, it also provides a place of inclusion for those who are on the margins of society. It was only until the last few decades that Native American tribes in the United States gained full autonomy and religious freedom. They had to fight for it. As we know in this class, we read a case about a Native, Native tribes in California whose sacred lands, whose tribal burial places, whose places of worship would be destroyed by a road the Forest Service wanted to build. The Supreme Court allowed it, but Congress created a national wilderness in that place. And ever since, we have seen Native tribes kind of fight for those rights. But we also see the eloquence of figures like Cesar Chavez and the farm workers, immigrants from Mexico and elsewhere, who drew upon their faith, in many cases their Catholic faith. Think of Cesar Chavez breaking his many fasts, his hunger strikes with a mass one time, get one time given by Robert Kennedy. So the point is, is that increasingly the world is in us. The diversity of the world is in us. And the promise of religious freedom at least is a promise that all will be included and accepted. Now, I want to give, I want to tell a story. I'm not going to try to be Nishala Hearn. I wouldn't try. Uh, but I'm going to tell a story about a wonderful uh, young woman. I often think of this story, I think of Merle Haggard, right? I'm proud to be an Okie from Muskogee, right? Well, Nishala Hearn was proud to be a Muslim in Muskogee. And there you see her. Um, she was suspended from school in Muskogee, Oklahoma, middle school, for wearing her hijab. And the reason given by the school authorities, they had a ban on gang dress in public schools. Right? Uh, pretty laughable. Well, in the great American tradition, what did her family do? They sued the school, of course. Right? Uh, now we shouldn't always go to law, uh, go to lawsuits, but they sued the school. And interestingly enough, Nashala Hearn, sweet Muslim girl from Muskogee, was represented by actually a conservative Christian legal advocacy advocacy group, because every once in a while people actually try to defend others' religious freedom as they want to defend their own. And sometimes they realize defending others' religious liberty is the way to defend their own. So she was, ad she, she was backed by this conservative legal advocacy group. And this was during the Obama administration. This was during the Bush administration. So the Bush Justice Department actually came down on her side. Well. The school authorities had an epiphany and realized that probably a Muslim hijab is not a sign of gang dress. And they ended their policy. But the story doesn't end there. So Obama's elected president, and he gives his first address, as he puts it, to the Muslim world in Cairo. And at one point, he's trying to convey how in America, Muslims are free to form their own mosques, to have their own worship, and Muslim women of cover are protected, uh, unlike France and elsewhere. 
And on the screen of the White House webpage was Nashala Hearn's photograph with a statement, the United States government came on her side to defend her right to wear the, her, her hijab. And there she is testifying on C-SPAN. Um, once again, we become a more inclusive society when we defend the rights of others, even others we disagree with, to have their soul freedom. So why is religious liberty a cornerstone? We learn from anthropology that there's something innately religious about human nature. Religion is pervasive in societies throughout history and throughout the world. Religion is foundational. People experience it as something that is so central to their own identity and dignity. So it's foundational. Another reason why religious liberty is a cornerstone is because the default condition of religion is pluralism. Great sociologist Peter Berger once said, you know, I thought that globalization would lead to secularization. No, it's led to plurality, where everybody is everywhere, cheek to jowl with religious others. And in fact, the great crucible of our time is learning to live with our differences in a shrinking world. And so, so many societies around the world attempt to deal with the innate pluralistic character of religion by what? Crushing it. Either state-enforced religion, harassment of dissidents, eradication of all religion, or the privatization of all religion, as China is attempting to do, or with the Uyghurs, religious genocide. But religious freedom protects and even celebrates that pluralism. It accepts that that is a reality. And that's what Putnam and Campbell find is the American grace, that even people who believe others may be going to hell actually can sometimes be allies in the defense of religious rights. We also know it's a cornerstone because independent religion unleashes civil society initiative. It is astonishing. Half of all volunteering in the United States is done through re religious congregations. Half of all donations to charity is through religious organizations. Robert Putnam said half of all the social capital, the norms and networks of reciprocity and trust that make cooperative engagement possible, half of all that comes through religious organizations. And what we learn from the American experience is that religious agency, the power to govern your own religious life, is in fact liberating. So let's turn to the global scene. Why is this a global talisman? Well, what is a talisman? A talisman is, is, is like a symbol or an object that is seen to have magical powers to achieve something you want to achieve, a, a better harvest and so forth. And in a sense, what a vast global scholarship, some of the most sophisticated social science I know, uh, is suggesting that there is something operating like that. A religious X factor that facilitates democratization, civil liberties, loyalty and trust. Look at this. You might think, is this possible <laughs> that religious freedom empirically, quantitatively, with case studies and experiments and vast global data actually does all of these things? That's the introduction to a book I'm co-authoring with a colleague at the University of Washington, Tony Gill, in which we marshal all of the global data. Now, I want to stress, we're not talking about religion per se. We're not talking about favored religions, we're talking about genuine religious freedom, the equality of all religious communities. So let's take a look at this. And as a backdrop, I think it's very important to note that the United States and our constitutional heritage actually played a pivotal role in enshrining religious liberty 
as a universal human right. Eleanor Roosevelt was appointed by the United Nations to chair the commission to draft the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Article 18, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes the freedom to change her religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest her religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Now, you notice I changed the pronouns here. There's actually a reason for that, because what you'll see is that new global research is suggesting uniquely that when women have the capacity to exercise religious agency, when they are not forced into straitjackets by regimes that align themselves with oppressive religion, when they can exercise their own agency, it actually unleashes their own empowerment. So here's the problem. We are facing a crisis of religious persecution around the world. And what we know from, in a sense, we know the negative. It's actually hard to measure a quantity of freedom, but what scholars are able to do is measure restrictions and repressions and oppressive laws and societal violence and mob violence and so forth. And we have great data on that and we can now empirically document that religious persecution, discrimination, favoritism produces conflict, propels civil wars, fuels many of the millions of refugees the world is confronting, and undermines democracy. When Vladimir Putin moved to consolidate his power in Russia, his first act was to repeal a religious freedom law in Russia that basically granted equal protections to all religious communities and basically said, we're going to privilege the Orthodox, and unfortunately, some of them caved to those blandishments. Something Roger Williams would, would say, don't do. Do not get into bed with power. Uh, you will become corrupted. Now, this is a very old slide. It's because the Pew Research Center's later studies, for whatever reason, just don't have this great pie chart. Um, so in 2009, 70% of the world's population lived in countries with high or very high restrictions on religion, either by governments or hostile social actors, powerful social actors that used intimidation and mob violence against minorities. That's up to over 78%. And it's many more countries. Here's what's happening. All around the world, governments are seeing the resurgence of global religion, its Nash, transnational force, and their default strategy is to try to crush it, which is the very thing that's going to produce the violence that they want to avoid. This is work by Brian Grimm and Roger Finke, and they have tremendous quantitative empirical data to suggest there is a kind of religious violence cycle. When governments restrict religion, it, really, it leads to violence related to religion, which leads to more social restrictions of religious freedom, which leads to more government. There's a cycle of societal repression, government restrictions, more violence. But there's a religious freedom cycle that when there is guarantee of religious freedom and equality, you tend to get broader participation in society. You tend to get more positive contributions in society. Religious freedom, we know, is a tremendous force of democracy. This slide just shows that authoritarian regimes have very high levels of repression of religion and that full democracies have very relatively low levels. So we have this data. But I want to talk about uh, a kind of argument than another one of my heroes makes. And so let's, let's listen to Abdul Karim Sarush for a minute. My name is Abdul Karim Sarush, and 
I'm a scholar. I received multiple degrees in various subjects, mostly philosophy, but also I'm a scholar of poetry, the poetry of Rumi. I actually translated into Iranian Farsi the, uh, the, uh, the great work by Karl Popper, um, An Open Society and Its Enemies. So I've been a great defender of liberty. And initially, when the Iranian Revolution happened, since I was so opposed to the Shah of Iran and his dictatorship, I initially supported it. But once I saw the Iranian clerics were going to use religious authority, were going to use the power of the state to enforce religious orthodoxy, I turned on the regime. I became one of their harshest critics. And let me say something about my insight is that there's, and I really liked what I heard from Roger Williams, state coercion absolutely produces tyranny, but it also produces hypocrisy. Because if people are afraid, they're going to be arrested unless they follow the orthodox views of the dominant religion, you're going to get a lot of hypocrisy. That's not authentic religion. It's stultifying religion. And state favoritism, in fact, produces corruption of the, of the religion. The Iranian clerics are corrupt. They're, they, they use their power for their own, their own enjoyment, power, their, their own blandishments. And what, what I did is during a great Iranian uprising in 2009 against a fraudulent election, I was at the Library of Congress, and I wrote an open letter to the regime in which I said, thank you, Ayatollah, for demonstrating the absolute corruptness of your regime. You have revealed to the world that you cannot be trusted with power. My family suffered because of that. But I also wanted to say that I've written about democracy and religion. And my argument is that religion must be free. It must flow through the limbs, the frosted limbs, and bring them alive. It, it intones from the minaret of freedom that there's no coercion in religion, that religion must be free. And so I put that in as poetic a term as I could, that freedom is authentic, that religion must have freedom to breathe, to flow, Otherwise, it will be stultified, and it'll produce autocracy and totalitarianism. I wanted to say that um, when I was having a conversation with Mr. Sarush at the Library of Congress in 2009, and I'd read about the Iranian uprising, and I knew what was going on, and we're having our conversation, and he's telling me, well, in the West, you're focused on rights. In the East, we focus on duties. We have to have a marriage of these. Um, uh, and then he said, of course, I wrote that open letter. And then I said, is your family still in Iran? And he said, well, yes. I said, they're going to be harassed, aren't they? Yeah. But I, everyone was expecting me to speak out. Millions were in the streets. How could I not speak out? And at that moment, I said, are you hoping you can have your family join you here? And he said, no, I want my family. I want to join my family in a free Iran. And at that moment, you have one of these moments where suddenly I couldn't hear the sound of the dishes and the conversation and the cafeteria. It was like I was in the presence a pure courage, a hero of conscience, someone who put their life on the line. Now let me talk about another aspect that we're learning, both from the American experience and from the global arena, why religious freedom is a talisman. How do you deal with the pluralism in religion? Well, a passage from the Quran, Surah 5, verse 48, I have embraced as part of my own corpus. And this is how the passage go, goes. Had God willed, he would have created one people with one religion. But he, but he chose to create 
many peoples, with many religions, so that what? They would vie one with another in virtue. So they would compete to do good. So that the competition would be to who, see who, which religious community can do the most good in society. To me, that is inherent in religious liberty, the competition. And in fact, one of the findings of global scholarship, some work by my, my colleague Tony Gill, is that free competition produces more responsive religion. And Professor Gill has studied Latin America and the democratization that took place there. Uh, and we know a great wave of democracy occurred, uh, especially owing to the leadership of Catholic authorities. The last great wave of a democracy was a Catholic wave. Um, but what he found was that where Catholics, Catholic leaders, were facing competition from Protestants, Pentecostals, who were winning souls and filling up their churches, Catholics became more responsive to the poor. Or they responded to messages from the Vatican about the dignity of the poor more vigorously. When Catholics got competition, they became more responsive. And what we now know through lots of empirical research is that kind of competition fuels uplift for the poor uh, and treats them better. Now, what about women's empowerment? This is one of the most paradoxical findings because if you read literature, uh, feminist literature, for example, uh, there is a deep critique of hierarchical religion and how it's oppressive of women. And certainly throughout history that has often been the case. But research by Rebecca Shaw, who was a World Bank economist and is now working for the Templeton Foundation, um, she discovered that religious freedom improves the lives of poor women. Now let me tell you what she actually did. She was working with hundreds of poor women in, in India and Sri Lanka and elsewhere in ghettos. And quite by accident, she discovered that when women converted from, let's say, Hinduism to another faith, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, especially Dalit women, the untouchables, who have no status within kind of the Hindu cosmology, when women converted, when they were able to exercise their religious agency by converting, she found they were empowered in other avenues of life. Something about the agency of being able to say, I criticize this religion. I want to join a different religion. I want to create a fellowship of fellow women in my own religious, in, 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 uh, with my own religious views. Something about that was powerful. And, it, and she actually documents that women who exercise religious agency are more successful with microenterprise, provide more support for children's education, report domestic abuse, have more family savings. And she's now doing experimental work, looking at women's groups in various places where there are opportunities for religious agency and where there are not. I want to turn now to perhaps one of the most powerful findings, most consequential findings of global research. Religious freedom is a talisman, a peace, a weapon of peace. I'm going to use for my guide uh, Nalei Seya, uh, who um, is author of this book, Weapon of Peace, How Religious Liberty Combats Terrorism. Uh, we had Nalei Seya give a guest lecture to our, uh, my global class um, on Zoom, of course. Um, and one of the things I learned as I was chatting with him, uh, he grew up in Pennsylvania, an immigrant of Indian parents in Pennsylvania, but a Christian family. And he said, um, I grew up in central Pennsylvania. He said, between Philadelphia and P Pittsburgh, it's often said is Alabama between <laughs> Pittsburgh and Philadelphia is Alabama. It's pietistic, evangelical, very conservative. 
Um, and he grew up in that environment. Um, and so he had a keen understanding of sort of religious life and so forth. But he went to, when he went to Notre Dame to do his doctorate, his, his chair, good friend Daniel Philpott, said, you know, maybe you should look at if there's any connection between religious repression, religious restrictions, and violence. And he thought, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And then he was stunned. It was almost linear. It was so powerful um, that he then did the most sophisticated study of the connection between terrorist incidents and religious repression in the world. Uh, tremendously sophisticated controls for every conceivable variable, uses all of these new global databases. By the way, we are kind of in it, what I would call a liminal moment. For centuries, even millennial time periods, people have talked, philosophers, theologians, about why freedom of religion is central to good societies, peaceful societies, even democratic societies. We're a liminal moment now because we actually have lots of global data. We have global terrorism databases. We have global restrictions information. We have democracy scores. We have civil liberty databases. So we can actually measure these things. And here's what he finds, that religious repression produces violence, terror attacks, civil wars, and refugees. But religious freedom is kind of a talisman of peace because it leads to greater community safety and civil peace, expanded civil society participation, and very important, an open marketplace of ideas. Where people are free to criticize the state, criticize the dominant religious authorities, where they are free to criticize, change, exit, militant theologies do not thrive. Militant theologies that promote terrorism often thrive in places where there's repression of religious minorities or where dominant groups feel privileged to harass others. So here are his key findings. Countries with low levels of terrorism are free from religious terrorism 99% of the time. Religious attacks occur in populous countries with high religious restrictions 95% of the time. And this one, religiously restrictive countries, countries that measurably have more restrictions on religion, either by states or dominant social actors, have 13 times more terrorist attacks than religiously free countries. We know that not only do countries have more terrorist attacks within them, they export terror elsewhere. They incubate terror. So we actually know that. Now, obviously, religious freedom then is a weapon of peace. By the way, he even controls for democracy. Because there are democratic countries, unfortunately, that are imposing harsher restrictions on religious practice, like France banning the hijab and elsewhere. He has predicted, he has testified that you can predict there will be religious violence in places that ban the hijab. So we know that. Well, unfortunately, in spite of the fact that the American experience of free religion, independent religion, independent civil society has been such a boon to our society when it worked, in spite of that experience, in spite of the fact that the American experience actually helped to lead the world to codify religious freedom as a universal right, and despite the fact that the United States even has a law to make promotion of religious freedom a core aspect of our foreign policy, in spite of all of that, there are troubles in the cradle of liberty. The Pew Research Center, which tracks uh, restrictions by governments and hostile social actors, has tracked a decade-long increase in the United States in both of those measures. In 2008, when they did their first report, 2009, the United States was on the low end 
of both government restrictions and social hostilities. Now we're no longer low. We're in the, quote, moderate category, which is no place you actually want to be. And that's because we've, hit, we've seen increasingly um, uh, increasing attacks against houses of worship, against Sikh Gurdwara, the synagogue, um, the Tree of Life Synagogue, um, the, uh, the, the, the African Methodist Episcopal Church in, the, in Charleston and so forth. We're seeing mob violence. We're seeing more intimidation and hate crimes and so forth. But we're also seeing more restrictions. We see efforts to stop zoning permits for mosques. We're seeing people make the argument, often in conservative circles, that because Islam is not a true religion, we don't have to accord it equal rights. We don't have to allow it to, a permit to build a mosque. So we're seeing restrictions, hostilities from both, both the right and the left. Uh, from the left, especially in the more secular left, Policymakers who have kind of less, you might say, experiential understanding of religion and religious communities and the good they do, uh, we're seeing more and more restrictions. So I often tell the story, how else than kind of just ignorance or um, amnesia, how else can you explain the six-year battle that the little sisters of the poor an order of nuns who are devoted to care for the elderly poor, how else can you explain that they have had a six-year battle with the federal government over whether they can govern themselves according to their religious principles and actually not incorporate contraceptives in their health plans? Whatever you might think of the contraceptive mandate, um, how can you explain that? But I would say on the right, a more disturbing trend, a kind of ethno-nationalist movement that characterizes this as this must be a Christian nation and, and, we, and we have to privilege Christianity over other groups. One of the lessons that we see from history and around the world is if you want religious freedom for yourself, you must defend it for all others. And thankfully, often that has happened, but I see tensions there. But I want to say something more. And, and so the question is, is, can we defend the liberties of others as much as our own? Right? Can we do that? Here's the concern. Religious free exercise has found itself engulfed in our tribal politics, in our culture wars. We all know what I'm talking about, right? Red state, blue state, conspiracy theories, mutual paranoia, mutual antipathy, the inability to, to work together. And so for some, religious freedom is now put in scare quotes as a cover for bigotry against LGBTQ persons. Um, and then on the right, there's talk of tyrannical government crushing religious freedom. And so, as Professor Robin Fretwell Wilson put it, unlike other wars, culture wars are never won. Culture loses, religious freedom will lose if it becomes depicted as just a part of one side's battle in the culture wars. This is deeply disturbing, and I, would just like to offer, I don't have an answer, just some personal reflections. I was inspired by the story out of Utah where a conservative Republican Mormon state representative said, I think we need to work with the LGBT community because we don't want to be at odds. And he went to them and they sat down and they said, all right, if, if we sponsor an, a, a bill against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, would you then work with us to carve out spaces for religious institutions to operate according to their own principles? And they hashed it out. They battled it out. But they were respectful 
of each other. And Utah passed one of the few laws, the, the only law in any red state that protects LGBTQ persons. I like the story because it inspires me that there's a possibility that through empathy, through respect, through tolerance, we can work ourselves out of this. I'm concerned that even some of my friends and colleagues who are fighting for religious liberty are, are increasingly depicting the transgender community as somehow hostile to them or antithetical to that quest. Let me tell you folks, as someone who has interviewed people who have been persecuted and tortured for their faith, I also have seen transgender persons as some of the most vulnerable, gentle persons. We have to figure out a way not to make this a culture war. Because religious freedom will lose if it is stigmatized. And the dignity of all persons will lose. In fact, the global scene presents us with, a, with an optimistic picture. While we may fight like cats and dogs in the United States, right? In fact, what Brian Grimm and his business, Religious Freedom and Business Foundation shows is that countries that protect religious freedom are actually more hospitable to LGBTQ persons. They're more hospitable to non-believers. Places where religious freedom is protected are more hospitable to the skeptic, the dissident, the minority, the vulnerable. That is a hopeful sign. All right, let me, let me conclude by telling you about another person I've gotten to know. I think I'll just talk about Rajdeep Singh for a minute here. Why is religious liberty, why is soul freedom a national cornerstone and a global talisman? Why is it such a powerful predictor of democracy and civil liberties and women's empowerment? Why is its repression such a powerful predictor of violence and turmoil and tyranny? Why is that? Well, I learned something when I was interviewing Rajdeep for the study I was doing at the Pew Research Center. Um, we call it lobbying for the faithful about all of the advocacy groups. And so I sought out um, Rajdeep and I found him in a tiny little ratty office in Washington, D.C., a two-person staff. That was the staff of the Sikh coalition at the time. Uh, and he was kind of their public advocate. So we couldn't interview there, so we went to a restaurant. And, um, and so we were, it's a, it was a nice summer day. We sat outside in an outdoor cafe. I put my microphone on and started to interview Rajdeep. And um, he was born in Miami to immigrant parents. He's obviously Sikh American. And he went to the University of Miami, got a degree in law, became an advocate, right? And so I remember one time when we invited him to the University of Oklahoma for our Religious Freedom Project, and, and uh, he came and lectured to my class, and he said, well, we Sikhs, this is how he said, we Sikhs, we're the ideal Americans, because we believed in religious freedom and gender equality in the 16th century, long before you people did, right? Uh, and, and, you know, I just noticed my students were kind of like disoriented. Like, he looks kind of exotic, but he talks like you, right? Um, but here was what was interesting. I'm interviewing him, and he said at one point, he said, you know, religious freedom is so special because, you know, if, if I go to France, I might have to take off my turban to get an ID. Sometimes if I go to airports, I have to go through intrusive screening, and he said, you know, we Sikhs have worked with the TSA to get less intrusive screening. But then, and he, so he said, here you can be who you are. 
that captured why religious freedom is so powerful. If it is the core of your identity, if your religious obligations go to the core of your identity, you want to live in a place where you can be who you are. Either not worship in secret for fear of reprisal or not become a hypocrite to prevent yourself from being jailed or beaten. That's the power of religious freedom. Here you can be who you are. And people whose freedom, their core freedom, their soul freedom, their ultimate concern, whatever you want to call it, is denied, see that, experience that as a fundamental violation of their dignity. Right? And all persons, whether they're believers, non-believers, minorities, vulnerable people, want to be who they are. But then he said this to me. He said, but you know, this is 2009. He said, you know, there is this bigoted law in Oregon. I didn't know. Um, he said, there's this bigoted law in Oregon against wearing religious dress in public schools. It was passed in the 1920s during a time when, yes, the Ku Klux Klan was powerful in Oregon because it had reconstituted itself as an anti-Catholic organization. The Klan was always racist, but it was also anti-Catholic. It saw itself as defenders of Protestant knighthood or whatever. At any rate, there was a time when the Klan had reconstituted itself and it married itself with a Protestant majority that was fearful of Catholics and their political power. We've learned about the Blaine Amendments in our class, right, about the fact that many states passed amendments banning any kind of public support for religious schools. It was aimed at Catholics. Well, in Oregon, they actually tried to make it illegal to have Catholic parochial schools. They passed another law at the same time period, banning and requiring every child to go to a public school under penalty of fines and jail time. The Supreme Court, even before it nationalized the, bill, the, 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 the First Amendment, struck that down as a violation of parents' autonomy and authority over their own children. That same state legislature, inspired by the Ku Klux Klan, passed a law making sure that no nuns were ever going to teach in the Oregon public schools. All right. what, what else would they mean by religious dress, right? Well, this is the thing about bigoted laws aimed at one community will redound to others. It's the same principle that if you defend religious freedom for yourself, as like the Jehovah's Witnesses did, in the flag salute cases, it'll open up the door to other religious minorities, right? So, so, he's, so this is the principle. Now, in Oregon public, now, there's, there's no nun with, a, with her, you know, the, the, the habit is going to be teaching in the Oregon public schools. But who does that law prevent from teaching in the Oregon public schools? Muslim, women of cover, Sikhs, Orthodox Jews. Right? So he says to me, so there's this Oregon law. And Sikhs cannot teach in the Oregon public schools. Neither can Muslim women of cover or Orthodox Jews. Any kind of religious dress is banned in Oregon public schools. He said, we're going to go after that law. And I remember thinking to myself, yeah, you and who else in this two little two person ratty office? But what is the genius of the promise of religious freedom in America? It's a promise everyone can embrace. And if one person's freedom is imperiled, they can build allies to others. And so he did go to Oregon. And he built an alliance of Jews and Muslims and Sikhs and Baptists and Catholics. And they got that law repealed. And at the bill... At the, uh, at the bill signing ceremony, no, actually, um, talk about that in a minute. 
at a banquet that I was attending later that year, 2011, 2010 maybe, um, the Baptist state senator who sponsored the law in Oregon, repealing that bigoted act against Catholics that was backed by Sikhs, was given an award by the Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> right? To me, that was, the, it was a beautiful illustration. But I want to leave you with an image. It's an image to me that captures what is the promise of religious freedom, not only here, but around the world. Because the bill signing ceremony, ending that bigoted law, repealing that bigoted law, was attended by a panoply of religious people, the new religious America. So let me leave you with this image. That, my friends, that is the portrait of the American heritage and religious freedom. That is America's promise to the world. Thank you all and God bless you.